So first of all, it's a great honor to be uh, asked to do this. It's just a fantastic uh, thing when I, when I heard that they were, that uh, Yale was interested in having me talk about the first great stock market crash. I thought, well, it's something I love to do. It's, a, it's 300 years out of date. Um, but um, the other thing that I like about this, um, this project, which I'll talk about uh, uh, now, is um, that it's an interdisciplinary research project. And it really embodies a lot of what uh, Yale's all about, which is um, collegial interaction, um, gathering data from many different kinds of sources, literary sources, uh, archival sources, uh, quantitative sources, using statistics, as well as using historical analysis. So, um, you know, the, the, everybody's interested in financial markets uh, for sure, but this is something that uh, is also kind of a reflection of the Yale ethos that uh, I thought would be an appropriate thing to talk about um, <clears throat> for this uh, inaugural lecture series. Uh, so I'm gonna be talking about um, a reinterpretation of one of the most famous uh, financial events in, uh, in world history. It comes in a, in a year that most people doesn't ring a bell with most people. Uh, so if I said crash of 1987, you know, that would ring a bell. But 1720, you're sort of fishing around in your head. What could have be happening in 1720? Why is that an important date? And I hope uh, at the end of this, uh, this period that I'm going to give you a sense of what, what makes it interesting and important <clears throat> and sort of what financial innovations um, uh, happened at that time. So as all uh, academic research, this uh, project really starts with a conjecture uh, a hypothesis to test and to explore. And uh, the, the broader conjecture, why are we looking at history so far in the past? Uh, I'm a financial economist, by the way. I teach at the Yale School of Management. Mostly what I talk about and think about is uh, financial markets uh, of the present day. Uh, but of course, financial markets of the present day, uh, we're constantly struggling with the issue of what causes a bubble, what causes a crash, uh, what are the fundamental factors that underlie these things. And so <clears throat> the uh, thought, the, the premise of this research is if we go back to the very first stock market bubble and we look at the underlying factors, we might be able to learn something about what all the subsequent bubbles uh, had in common. So uh, that's, that's the basic idea here. <clears throat> and um, the lesson uh, that, the takeaway from the, I'll tell you the conclusion uh, first before I show you the evidence. Um, the takeaway is that financial bubbles are associated uh, with periods of innovation in, in interesting ways, not just innovate, technological innovation, but also um, we argue uh, together that it, it's associated with financial innovation. Uh, and uh, so the, the, the first, um, this first market bubble is, you can think about it as a laboratory for testing this idea. <clears throat> okay, so uh, when I say a bubble, um, I'm gonna sketch out the parameters uh, for you, but this is a stock market bubble of unbelievable proportion, um, and it starts out in France, and then it spreads, there's contagion, it spreads to Britain, and then it spreads to the Netherlands, and then after the Netherlands, it spreads to other parts of the, other parts of the world. We've got, uh, uh, it's got two pieces to it. One is the stocks that are trading at that time, they go up by factors of 10 in one year, or in less than a year. Uh, and uh, so, you know, I could be sitting here with my, uh, with my nest egg, all invested in the equity markets, and all of a sudden I'm 10 times richer. That's the magnitude of this, 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 this bubble. And the other thing is, not only was there a bubble in the prices of stocks at the time, but also there was an enormous new market for new companies. We call them IPOs, initial public offerings. All of a sudden, people in England, in London, were thinking of new ideas for companies, taking these ideas to the market. People would invest in them. They'd, uh, they'd trade in the shares uh, of these securities. And, so it was, uh, you know, not only a, a rise in price, but a spreading of the idea of using the financial markets to, um, to, to generate, to, to fund new ideas, new, uh, new technologies. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. <clears throat> okay, so um, here's the research background I mentioned um, uh, uh, that relates to Yale. Uh, first of all, first of all 
Uh, my colleague, Geert Roanhorst, uh, who's also a professor in finance uh, at the School of Management, he and I started out on a, a project together um, that, uh, <clears throat> that sort of launched this investigation. Um, and uh, it started out with a modest goal of trying to collect some old stock prices from, 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 the, from Amsterdam, and it kind of grew from there. But underlying this is <clears throat> this um, project that we have at the School of Management of, of uh, it's a joint venture with the Beinecke Library to collect old financial instruments, a history of finance, um, uh, and, and you know, get the kind of key documents in financial history as part of Yale's collections. So as you'll, you'll see, we draw heavily on the Beinecke Library collections and, and a couple of the, uh, the, in, the things that we were able to acquire for Yale uh, were part of the Beinecke's uh, 50th anniversary celebration. They showed their great treasures. So some of them were financial treasures and that got me really excited um, to have people thinking about the library not only as a resource for sort of literary treasures and Gutenberg Bible, but also stuff that you can study history of finance and history of business. Um, now, uh, one of the things that we do is, <clears throat> uh, since we're economists, we go and we collect price data. And so part of this project was collecting old stock prices from London and from Amsterdam uh, and Rotterdam, as a matter of fact, uh, that uh, really had not been looked at before. So we go back into these newspapers 300 years uh, uh, prior and we're, we copy out the stock prices and also actually we're reading the old news uh, about why the prices were moving around. Uh, so there's a heavy dose of statistical analysis as well as archival research. Um, and then uh, we had um, an, uh, this project then turned into an interdisciplinary collaboration with art historians, um, historians of uh, theater, um, historians of the, uh, pe pe people who, who study uh, uh, the history of the book. Um, and uh, so you'll see why all of these folks came together. Um, and uh, so uh, the final result of this project is a volume that, we, um, that is forthcoming. It will come out actually next month uh, from the Yale Press, uh, where we've got the range of people from, from economists to historians to literary scholars and so forth contributing to a volume uh, all about this first stock market crisis. Okay, so I'm gonna start with a guy, uh, a really interesting character, his name is John Law. And um, if you've never heard of him, he's, he's the greatest financier that ever lived by certain measures. Uh, and it was his kind of brilliant notion that led to this first great bubble and uh, ultimately to the crash. But he was, uh, he's a, Scot a Scotsman who was convicted and imprisoned for uh, murder uh, in London and uh, in the, in the uh, uh, early 1700s. He fled the country um, and uh, ended up running a gambling uh, casino uh, to the crowned heads of uh, Europe. And, um, and uh, so he then ended up to be finance minister of France. So this is a crazy time in, in world history that, a, that you know, a, a, a guy that runs a gambling casino, uh, and actually got rich by running that gambling casino, could end up uh, running, uh, running, the finance, uh, running France's finances. But on top of that, he was a brilliant economist and he had a wonderful idea about how to reorganize the debt of, of, um, uh, of France. <clears throat> and uh, the idea of reorganization was take all the French debt and you exchange it for stocks. So um, he said, uh, you know, let's float a company that uh, actually the company owns the company that he he acquired um, was the company that owned uh, Louisiana territory. So uh, he you know he owned this great swath of North America, and he said, "You bring your bonds in the French debt. You bring your bond in, and I'll exchange it for a share, which is uh, which is uh, going to be a, a worth a lot when Louisiana really gets going." So that was the whole idea of this. I mean, if we could think about how to do that now, I keep thinking right now, how could we solve our current debt uh, crises? What could we exchange you know, uh, in ex uh, to, to lower the debt through some deal like that? I'm racking my brains, I can't figure it out, but imagine somebody that was clever enough to do that. 
Now, this is John Law, and uh, th this, you can't see this very well, but there is a little guy up here looking out over the street. His, this is John Law, and this is the Mississippi bubble. So I said it's the, the Mississippi company was the company that he founded, or actually he acquired, and he started trading, it, 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 people when they got the shares, they started to trade them like crazy. So here's the Rue Quincampoix uh, in Paris, and uh, there are all these people going nuts just uh, exchanging shares in this and bidding the prices up and so forth. Um, this street is still, uh, you can still go visit this street. It's fantastic. You, you go to the, the Centre Pompidou, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, I guess, Boubourg, and uh, you go two streets right behind that, and the street looks almost exactly the same now as it did 300 years ago, minus the throngs and crowds and so forth. So here's what the company did. <clears throat> it starts out at this very low price, and all of a sudden when John Law gets hold of, uh, hold of this idea of doing this debt for equity swap, the, the shares shoot up like crazy. Part of it's because they knew that the other people behind uh, the deal was, the, uh, one person was the Prince Regent. So, you know, the, the, the head of state essentially was also a partner in this. They thought, how could I lose? Um, and so <clears throat> this notion of uh, investing in the, in the distant future, if you will, which is the uh, Mississippi territories, uh, drove the stock price up more than 10 times, actually about 20 times. And then you'll see here there was this terrible cr uh, crisis, which I'll talk about later. But by early 1720, by February in 1720, people felt like they had made lots and lots and lots of money. OK, I just had to put this picture in to give you a sense of what they were speculating on. You think of our dot-com bubble uh, you know, in the 90s, and, and people were you know, b uh, buying shares in companies that would uh, you know, provide, you could sell dog food over the web and all of this other stuff, you think that's really crazy. Imagine um, a company <clears throat> where the, they were betting on something that, here's the settlement of, here's the first settlement of New Orleans, okay? And about the time this was going on, people were living in these weird little hovels in New Orleans, they really couldn't get much going, and uh, so this was completely pie in the sky in the sense that there was no current revenue, it was all future revenue. You had to believe that com controlling the, the, uh, the, the mouth of the Mississippi River, and the Mississippi River being the, the road into the North American continent, had to, in the long run, pay off. So that was the idea behind this. Um, now, I said that this speculation um, went on to London, in London, you can also walk by the, uh, the, the South Sea House. So the Company of the South Seas, uh, that's, that's um, another company that had speculative interests in, um, uh, in America. Now, when you hear South Seas, you think, well, that must be about the Pacific Ocean, you know, because that's the way we think about it now. But not at all. It was the South Atlantic that the Company of the South Sea was designed to exploit. And <clears throat> Uh, this South Sea House, um, uh, there are these statues up here that have these great pictures of, of uh, the, the Navy and the Indians and sort of this mm, allegorical motif of the value of trade in the, in the South Atlantic. The company, uh, however, was um, one part of the company, of course, uh, was kind of uh, echoed the Mississippi Company, which is um, it had the right to... Um, uh, to, to trade, to the extent that the Spanish would let them in, it had the right to trade with all of South America. Um, but the other thing it had, it had, it had acquired the right from the Spanish crown, uh, the exclusive right to trade uh, in, in, in uh, African slaves. So, so this company was founded on, you know, the sort of reprehensible notion that, that, uh, that uh, it would uh, get slaves in Africa, or buy them from another company called the Royal uh, African Company, and then uh, tra sell them in, uh, in the Caribbean. So people uh, all had this notion that because the Caribbean islands, for example, were beginning to be sugar islands that really were quite productive and important economically, s slaves were the, the, were the key, the labor was the key ingredient to making that work, and the, the company in the South Seas had the right to deliver uh, the labor to, um, uh, uh, to, to uh, to the Caribbean. Now, the other part, of course, was just the same thing that happened with the Mississippi Company. 
England had all of these debts. Actually, they got debts by fighting each other. Uh, and uh, so England had all these debts. And the British said, well, let's do the same kind of swap. Let's uh, do an ex equity. We'll exchange shares in this uh, speculative venture for the debt of the, uh, of the government. So what happened with both of these cases is the government offloaded a bunch of debt. People that got the shares expected only a very small dividend in relationship to the shares. And so um, it was kind of a win-win situation as long as the hope of the Atlantic trade was uh, sufficient to keep people believing that the, um, that, the, that the stocks were worth a lot of money. So is that a bubble or is that speculation on, on uh, genuine economic uh, uh, future value? Um, this is a little hard to see, but um, William Hogarth, if, uh, uh, famous uh, in, you know, engraver, cartoonist, artist, printmaker, and so forth in Great Britain. The, the, the back story is that he got his, uh, his first great picture that made his uh, reputation was making fun of the uh, South Sea bubble. And he did this in 1721, so a year after the bubble. And you can sort of see kind of strange things going on. Here's a guy stripped naked on a, uh, on a rack that's... Uh, the, um, that's a, uh, a, a round a wheel or, or so, and uh, he's, a, uh, he's a shareholder who's been, uh, take, had all of his money taken from him essentially, and he's enduring the agony of, of, uh, the, of, uh, of the bubble. And then there's this merry-go-round kind of thing with uh, people sort of suggesting that crazy stuff is, uh, people were going crazy and they treated it like a carnival, the whole speculative uh, process of bidding up South Sea Company shares. We'll look some, at some more of this in just a minute. So I told you that there were these two bubbles. So the second bubble starts after the first and actually keeps, keeps going. You, you know, it, it rises to its peak even after the other one has dropped down. So it's a successive series of, of, of speculative uh, thrills. Um, and uh, it goes up uh, quite a bit as well. Uh, but um, <clears throat> likewise ends up in this catastrophic uh, crash. By the way, that's just the South Sea Company. So here we have two firms, Mississippi Company, South Sea Company, um, trading. <clears throat> okay, this, this is a picture that sort of shows you what we added to that. So up to this point, I've just told you a story that most people that study this time period uh, know well, uh, which is um, this uh, uh, story of these two firms. So uh, Geert Roenhorst and I, and actually our, our uh, young colleague Rick Freyen, who's uh, also, who, who's Dutch, he, he, uh, he uh, is uh, at Tilburg University right now. Um, what we did is we said, maybe there's some more information there. And we went to, um, we went to London, we got archi archival material in London, at, at, and um, we found actually a lot more stock prices. Some of these were available from other researchers, but some of them we found uh, uh, on our own. And what I want to point out to you that's interesting about this picture, you see there's, also, there's a big bubble that happens over the course, essentially over the course of 1720, and all the stocks go up and down, right? Not just the South Sea Company. South Sea Company is the purple dot. You can see uh, the, 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 uh, this dark purple dot here. It rises, flattens out for a while, then it falls. But the thing that caught our eye were these two other stocks. One of them is, um, one of them is called the London Assurance Company. The other one's called the Royal Exchange Assurance Company. So it's not such a sexy story about like two insurance companies bubbling. You know, it's like, what's going on here? Why, uh, why are these, uh, these insurance companies uh, leading the pack, rising much higher, um, crashing before the South Sea Company crashes, right? So they crash, they crash actually a couple or three weeks before the South Sea Company comes down. And also, if you, you want to take a look here, notice this orange line. This is something called the York Building Society. This is a crazy company where some guys bought a shell company that could deliver water to central London, and then they used it to start an ins a life insurance company where they bought confiscated estates in Scotland, and they used that, the revenues from those estates to, to back their life insurance firm. And so these were quite 
wheeler dealer financial engineer types um, that um, <clears throat> saw an opportunity to capitalize that company quite well to get the public to 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 invest in that company and you and and, and so that's why it sort of starts halfway through the year um, they they sort of they, they they start their funding process um, <clears throat> when they see that the stocks are all going up and people like to buy shares okay so um, I'll be hinting around a little bit, but, but um, a central question is what caused the bubble? Um, and the, if any of you were Robert Schiller's talk, uh, my, my colleague Bob Schiller is a behavioral economist, and I am too, by the way, I confess. Uh, I'm interested in psychology and the stock markets. And the, um, the, the, the premise uh, that you generally hear is that Occasionally, people go absolutely crazy. They bid stock prices up. They're completely irrational about why the about the whole uh, process of valuation, and then and then all of a sudden they come to their senses. Something triggers it, and everything goes back down again. Uh, a wild madness descends on the markets, and ex post we realize we sober up and we realize we were all complete fools, and um, you know we'll never do it again. That's, that's sort of the behavioral finance story. In this, uh, in this research, we, we, we turn to a different story, which is maybe what's going on is that the, North Atlant the Atlantic trade was perceived as an economic opportunity with unlimited potential. Um, and I mentioned, uh, I've talked a little bit about that already. Uh, if you could buy shares in uh, Louisiana now, the whole, the whole swath of, of the, the um, drainage of the Mississippi and Missouri rivers, you know, you might be tempted to do that. <clears throat> but there are a couple other things which uh, I, I hope I'll get to in this talk, and one of them uh, is corporate freedom. Um, during this, the years of 1720, one of the things that happened was that um, corpora corporations decided that they were just going to they were, they were just going to do, they were going to go off the uh, reservation. Instead of following the charter that they were uh, given by Parliament to, let's say, uh, bring water into central London or uh, uh, pursue fishing opportunities in the North Sea, they said, this corporate form is fantastic. It allows us to raise money, plus it also gives us limited liability. So let's just form a company and then we'll decide what to do. We'll just pursue any kind of opportunity that looks advantageous to us. This was a brilliant new idea, that, uh, and it made Parliament really angry, because the way Parliament, uh, the way people, Parliament funded itself, at least indi individually, was they said, "Well, if you want a charter to, to um, for an insurance company, what are we going to get? What are we going to get? You know, we're going to get shares." Uh, what's the trade-off here? So, um, so uh, I mean, I'll tell you, make a long story short, the South Sea Company ended in a big bribery trial. Um, and so when companies took this step to pursue these various kinds of uh, th uh, opportunities, there was a negative reaction. It was called the Bubble Act. The Parliament came down hard and said, no more of this uh, issuing of these um, <clears throat> company, free companies. Uh, we're going to be ga serious gatekeepers. And if we catch you trading the shares of these things that we haven't authorized, then you're in even deeper trouble. It's against the law. So um, I'll show you a little bit about the effect of that bubble act uh, in a minute. OK, you can't see this too well either, but um, uh, it's the cover of a book. <clears throat> And the book, um, uh, the, the book is, uh, it was a gift uh, from a very good friend of mine um, who said, you know, you're interested in finance. I found this old book. I know you're going to love it. And what it turned out is this old book um, uh, contains, in some sense, the answer to those questions about what caused the bubble. And Beinecke Library also has a, a terrific uh, version of this book. It's called uh, the Headquarter uh, Tafarel de Devashed, and um, it's got uh, um, it's in Old Dutch, uh, and you can see something Kunst uh, Kunstplaten, 
And uh, so uh, uh, with, art, uh, with, with uh, art plates and, comedy, and, and plays and, uh, and poetry, and uh, it was published right at the end of the year 1720. So most of this research is just a sort of meditation on what the heck is this book? Um, <clears throat> why, uh, and, and uh, um, this book, by the way, also has something called Conditions and in, 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 in Projectin uh, for Companies. So the book actually contains a whole bunch of information, financial information that people just generally skip over. It was a real. It was a um, book that was written to make uh, uh, to, to make fun of the stock market bubble in in Holland and also in France and England. Um, and uh, nobody knows who wrote the book. We know sort of when it was published. Uh, it was published anonymously uh, because it was such a bitter uh, critique. Um, and then it was distributed primarily in Amsterdam, but a lot of uh, a lot of uh, copies exist. So in this book, usually when you look at this book, you flip to the f hilarious allegorical scenes. Uh, and uh, so here would, here's an example. Um, uh, it's a picture of all of the speculators uh, like running like lemmings up a hill and then over a cliff, and they're following the goddess of fortune. Uh, and uh, meanwhile, all sorts of funny things are happening down here. Um, and <clears throat> so. It's a picture of, uh, of, of, of madness and folly. So it accords really closely to what our current notion is of, uh, of what, is a what happens during a stock market bubble. Sometimes, all of a sudden, for no reason, people heard. They're following each other, and, uh, <clears throat> and it gets them into deep trouble. Um, that's in the book. Um, and the book actually, as we look at it, we, just, we sort of figured out that the book is almost a whole theory about, uh, about why, a, why a bubble happens. But the theory is not worked out in mathematical terms, it's worked out in allegorical terms, the allegorical language of the 18th century. Um, and <clears throat> so here's, uh, so the f the, the, this is a second theory that appears in the book, that, um, that, that the, the bubble was actually caused by a mental disorder, a brain disorder. So it was mental uh, uh, dysfunction. And <clears throat> if you look at this, this is a picture of surgery, of brain surgery in the 18th century. Um, the doctor has uh, got this hat on. It's kind of like the hat I'm going to have to wear on Sunday when we have the inauguration. Um, and um, then his patient is strapped into this chair. And all of this information is sort of telling you about the patient going bankrupt. But what's go what, what he's doing is he's cutting the guy's head. And the way this worked is that the doctor would pretend like there was, he was taking a stone out of somebody's head. So uh, he'd make the cut. He'd then go like this. And a stone would drop out into a bucket. And it would go clank. And that was the, um, that was the best they could do in terms of brain surgery in the 18th century. Okay, uh, they also thought that this was due to some uh, evil, uh, the influences of evil, that is, man's uh, e uh, evil nature. So here's a picture from this uh, head wrote to Tafarel of the devil with all, see all these things? These are shares, stock certificates. And the devil is whipping them on to buy these share certificates. So uh, there's a deep moral um, kind of view of this. And it's the same thing we have now, sort of uh, the first thing that comes to mind when you hear about a bubble is the word greed, um, and uh, one of the sort of seven deadly sins. And, <clears throat> and this book really got that whole, well, this is the first articulation of this notion as applied to the financial markets. Here's a picture of John Law, um, but um, he's on his way. Uh, he's being uh, carried on the backs of this shareholder and being sent on his way to hell. So, uh, you know, we've said a lot of nasty things about financial speculators over the last decade or so, but um, I don't think we've quite gotten to this level of, uh, of damnation. Okay, so that's the sort of uh, one perspective uh, that comes out of this book. There's another perspective in this book, however, and that's about the opportunity. And the book Weirdly enough, a book about, the, about finance and, and, uh, and so forth, it's got a whole map of Texas in it. 
So, uh, so I'm, I'm from I'm a Texan, uh, and so the, uh, I was I was kind of shocked that uh, I'd be able to, to st that this map appeared in here. I was wondering why. Uh, I was looking for where my home might you know where where is Austin in this picture and so forth. But um, the map is in there because of the Mississippi Company, and the notion is, hey, l l let's show you actually the, the the geographically the grounds for people's speculative uh, enthusiasm. Uh, and some of the vignettes in this book go into a lot more detail uh, about the uh, logic of investing in the Mississippi. So here's this fin a really beautiful little print of, the, of the, uh, the French trading with the Indians of the Mississippi River. And here are the great mountains of Louisiana um, that, they have, uh, that they're, um, <coughs> they're exploring, right? Um, and uh, <coughs> there's the Mississippi River spelled all sorts of ways. But it's meant to give you kind of a bucolic view. This one's a little hard to see, but this is the king and the queen of, of the Mississippi. They're shown to make you feel like they're prosperous and friendly and so forth. And then um, there's another vignette which basically says, uh, trust me, uh, everything there is filled with sugar and gold. OK, now, uh, I said that there was a sort of the secret in this book that really helped understand uh, what people at the time recognized as the root of the bubble. And uh, so it starts with this print. <clears throat> uh, this print is by a man named uh, Picard, who was a French uh, printmaker who lived in Amsterdam. Uh, it's a very complex and beautiful print, but it starts, it's a pro procession that extends from a coffee house called the Kankapoil Coffee House, but it's a coffee house in Amsterdam. And by the way, if you're in the dam in Amsterdam and you go to the main shopping street, you can see the, at least the place where this was. not a coffee house anymore. It's an upscale little shop. But you can see the building that this is. And out of that comes this incredible cart that's being uh, the, with the fortune, Lady Fortune above there, and pushed along by some stockbrokers. And then it, the procession swirls around like this, and it goes into one of three doors. It, it, the procession of this stock market goes to either the poor house <clears throat> or the hospital or the insane asylum. So there's a model uh, for you about you know, what, what's going to happen to speculators. And Folly is the, leading the cart. She's got her skirt tipped up. And then who's dragging the cart? That's the interesting issue here. So let me zoom in on that. And actually, the, the who's dragging the cart, this thing was, this print was actually tipped in so you couldn't see that this, in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, <clears throat> in the channel of the book. It made it very hard to figure it out. But what you'll see here is that the Mississippi Company, who's already hobbled uh, because of that early crash, is leading the pack. And then the, the South Sea Company, Mer du Sud, is the, uh, is, is the other. So the, it, the, these two companies were leading the, 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 the bubble. But then as you go back, you can see that there is the, there's a, a bank uh, involved. John Law actually started a bank. There is a company in the back called the West, and that company was the Dutch West Indies Company. Okay? So that was referring to the fact that this was also a Dutch uh, bubble, and that it involved the Dutch West Indies Company. And then <clears throat> finally back here, there's the East Indies Company. You can see with this oriental kind of uh, costume. And in the very back, there's this little character. And I'll zoom in a bit. And the character is called Assurance. So it's the London Assurance Company. So we've done all of this work. We ferreted out all of these stock prices. We were puzzling about the insurance company. We open the book back up again. If you look at really carefully, the people at the time are telling us, it's insurance. Yeah, it's all this other stuff about the Atlantic trade, but insurance is really important. Again, why would insurance be important? Um, by the way, when we look at it, we did our numbers. Insurance bubbles a lot compared to all these other kinds of things. The Atlantic trade bubbled uh, a kind of average, but if we take all the different companies that were trading, even those small companies that I don't have price series for, but we can get the bubble amount it bubbled from other sources, <clears throat> we find um, that insurance was really big. 
Okay, so on to pirates, uh, on to, to the Atlantic trade. So insurance uh, is important now, and I guess in, in, insurance companies worry a lot when a boat goes around the Horn of Africa, or go, goes around uh, 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 the coast of Africa these days, right? Because the pirates attack the boat, uh, and uh, they, there are big payoffs involved. Um, <clears throat> but insurance before 1720, it was organized typically as a set of uh, unlimited liability partnerships. Lloyd's of London for a long time was organized in such a way that if you were insuring a, a, a vessel, um, uh, you know, you were somebody that invested in this pool and if the losses were really large, you'd have to come up with money out of your own pocket and you could be ruined. Um, that kind of made insurance unattractive for some, for some people who didn't have infinitely deep pockets. Um, and also it meant that uh, you had trouble diversifying your risk if you didn't have a lot of uh, opportunities to pool that risk. Um, and <clears throat> so uh, the, the kind of structure of the insurance industry was not keeping up with these, uh, the expansion of trade. And so the Atlantic uh, trade um, involved hurricanes, it involved pirates. Here's a picture from Jack Rackham uh, <clears throat> uh, died in 1720, uh, but uh, pirates were really a big problem uh, leading up to that, to that year and, and certainly following. Okay, so <clears throat> you have these two uh, companies that I mentioned, plus a few other ones that had started up that we don't have stock prices for. And uh, people's enthusiasm, perhaps about the Atlantic trade, but perhaps simply about the idea that you could create a corporation instead of a partnership that could sell insurance, um, <clears throat> really, we think, was the root of the excitement about the prices going up. If you had a corporation, you, could, you had limited liability. That solved one of the problems. If you could raise a lot of capital from the public markets, which meant that you could create a big pool of capital and uh, you could therefore diversify across lots of voyages. So the corporate form applied to insurance was quite an important innovation, a risk-sharing innovation. And as you might imagine, it was met with stiff resistance uh, by all uh, the existing uh, insurance uh, <coughs> groups, uh, but um, uh, it was chartered by, um, uh, it was actually chartered at the same time, those two companies were, were chartered as the first two insurance companies in Great Britain uh, with limited liability by the same act that was the Bubble Act, which prevented um, any more uh, companies from being launched. launched. <coughs> So just when they created this new financial form for insurance, they shut the door and said, nobody else can do this again. Now, uh, there were troubles with these insurance companies. Uh, they, they had, uh, in order to get the uh, parliament to go along with that, matter of fact, in order to get the king to go along with it, um, they, they had to pony up a, a significant bribe, and the bribe had to come in a hurry. It was due in September uh, of the year that the firms were launched. <clears throat> And, uh, of course, Parliament was not uh, going quietly uh, about this whole arrangement. Um, a committee in Parliament was formed in order to figure out whether or not these companies were actually following the charter, uh, or whether they're just raising money to write all sorts of different kinds of insurance. And uh, I'll show you a little bit more about that in a bit, but <clears throat> um, the Attorney General uh, issued a writ of sera facis, which challenged these companies um, and, uh, and hauled them up before Parliament to explain, uh, you know, what in the heck they were doing and whether they were following the rules. Another couple of things happened that made these companies create problems. They wrote all this insurance, one of them wrote all this insurance, and then the first time, uh, the, the, right out of the box, there was a, the whole fleet that they uh, insured sunk. So it was, uh, you know, uh, it was a disaster. <clears throat> and then there was some weird burglary that happened uh, one of the homes of the directors. 
Um, okay, a bit more about where this thing happened. If you've been in London, here's the Royal Exchange. You think, well, that's where all the stock exchanges were going on. Not so. They mostly took place in this little place called Exchange Alley, which was close to the post office. So um, the, the news would come about a boat uh, being sunk. If you had to wait to trade on it, if you said, I'm going to run to the exchange to trade on it, you'd be too late because somebody's already trading on that news halfway along the way. All right, well, so this, this, this act, this bubble act, um, opens the door to a new form of uh, financial organization for risk sharing, and then it closes the door immediately on anybody else being able to copy it. So um, it took only a couple of weeks for somebody to figure out that, let's take this idea, let's go over to Holland, where there's no law about, no, no bubble act, and we'll, 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 we'll start some insurance companies over there. Um, this guy, <coughs> um, Edmund Hoyle, um, uh, puts together a prospectus and goes over to Rotterdam with another friend, of, uh, with another uh, associate, Gerard Reuters, and they propose a Rotterdam insurance company. Um, and if you've heard of Ed, uh, you probably heard of Edmund Hoyle before, because whenever you say according to Hoyle, this is the Hoyle. He made a lot of money. This is the first and only business deal he ever did. He made a vast amount of money issuing, starting this new company. He cashed out after three weeks and retired for the rest of his life to teach playing cards and play. That's him, yeah? Another, that's right, another gambler. Um, <clears throat> so, um, another part of our research saga is, we said, well, if they started these companies over in Holland, let's find the prices. So my colleague Rick Freyen went over and dug through People have been looking for these prices for a century. And he doggedly went through in every archive in the Netherlands. And he finally found an archive that had newspapers that had the prices. So for the first time, we could look at the third leg of this great bubble. And the leg that was associated with this book that was published in, uh, in Amsterdam. So um, there are a couple of companies that preceded this. This is the Dutch East Indies Company and the Dutch West Indies Company. And the Dutch West Indies Company, um, I think you can see it here, did go through a, quite a bubble over the period. But then um, <clears throat> we also have this Rotterdam Company that starts up. You really can't see much from this picture. The reason I want to show it to you is because it's got lots and lots of companies on it. Just as in Britain, they were, start, they were issuing all these new IPOs because they thought, this is great, we can go to the public capital markets for new ideas. The same concept of the freedom of the corporation, that is also jumped the channel. And so um, <clears throat> not, only did the, not only did the idea of insurance corporations come over, the idea of the stock market as a place to get capital uh, and, and, and not have to ask permission for doing business um, also jumped the channel. Most of these companies in Holland, for which we collected data, um, are companies that have uh, uh, city names to them. That's just the way business was conducted in Holland. Um, even the Dutch East India Company was created by merging the individual city uh, trading uh, firms into one. And the same kind of structure here, we have um, not just the, uh, uh, you know, not just the Rotterdam Company, which also issued a second subscription when the first one did well, but oh, we have all these different cities, uh, <coughs> uh, Middleburg and Shidam and, and, uh, uh, and Edam, actually half the names of the Dutch cheeses that you can think of are up here, okay? And also, here's the business they were in, almost all of them in the insurance. So this is an insurance craze. But also they said, we'll do other things. We'll do other kind of commerce, international trade, go fishery in the, in the, in the, in the, uh, in the north, uh, uh, in the Davis Strait and things like that. <clears throat> Oops. Okay, I told you that part. Um, a little bit about how an IPO worked at that time. Um, you didn't pay all your money down and buy a share of stock. You put down 5%, you got a right to buy the stock. Okay, so a lot of people could afford to get involved in the market when you only had to put a little bit of money down. Um, in our Beinecke collection, we were able to acquire which I, something which I think is the only 
uh, surviving uh, early share certificate from one of these speculative ventures. And uh, <clears throat> so this is a company that was started uh, to uh, import timber from Bremen and Hamburg. Um, and uh, so you can see it's kind of a, it is just a little ticket that allowed you to buy uh, some, buy, buy a thousand pounds worth of this share. And you can see it's set up over here with a kind of a complicated device. That's a way to prevent counterfeiting of this thing. Um, oops. This is a broadside from, that, that we have in our um, Walpole collection. Uh, and it's called the Bubbler's Mirror, or England's Folly. So England had, this is a list, we got a lot of data from this thing. This is a list of all of the funny companies that were started. Insurance on horses, for example, was one of the companies. Um, a company for the manuring of land was, was created. Uh, here's the Royal Assurance Company, the London Assurance Company. One of the things I thought would fun here, um, in my day job, I study um, hedge funds, and there's a company called Wesley's Actions. Actions mean stock uh, shares, okay? Wesley's Actions is a company that was started to invest in stocks, okay? So to speculate in stocks. So it's the, I think it's the first hedge fund. I'm going to make that claim. Um, I told you about the Royal Exchange and London Insurance Corporation Act, i.e. the Bubble Act. <clears throat> Um, but it uh, prevents the raising, the transferring of stock, the transferring of shares in such stock, and the, that will be forever deemed illegal and void. So how to shut down a financial market? Try a parliamentary decree that says you can't have any, you can't trade in shares. So what happened when that... Was it retroactive or just going forward? Going forward. So everybody was grandfathered. Everybody was grandfathered, but you couldn't sell the shares that you had. This... This, this document right here refers to um, acts uh, passed in this session of, parla of, of Parliament. And uh, so they were hoping that, they, that this, they would be grandfathered by that, but it turns out they weren't. They would, they, um, and of course, whenever you say something can't be, uh, whether you pr whenever you say something is not allowed to be done, okay, well, guess what? They, people are probably trading these things all the time anyway, uh, but, um, but we know that the law tried to stop it. Proscriptive and descriptive historical evidence. Okay. Prescriptive. Okay, so uh, of course there's a market reaction. And up to this point, before people had looked carefully at the data, at the daily data, nobody really could figure out how the bubble act related to the crash. Because the South Sea Company didn't go down for quite some time before the, uh, after the Bubble Act. So part of this research was trying to sort through um, the events that led up to the peak and the events that triggered the crash. And our contribution to the research in this area is to show that the Bubble Act caused the crash in the, in the British shares. And by the way, I'm plotting here Royal Exchange Assurance, uh, London Assurance, but also in the South Sea Company, but I'm also plotting Rotterdam Company and the West Indies Company, so the Dutch West Indies Company is in this pig figure, and I've had to put them all on one chart, even though they were in two different calendars at this time, Julian and Gregorian calendar, but I've got it synced up pretty well, and what you can see is not only do the bubble, the two British companies go up and then crash, but the West Indies Company also peaks at the same time, and then it also crashes. So this was an international stock market crash with contagion that jumps across the channel. So anyway, uh, one of the things that you could see is, first of all, the Bubble Act is signed here, but then nobody really knows how it's going to be enforced. But it was not until the, this period that the Treasury decides to, to actually enforce the Bubble Act with this writ of Sierra Fasis, which then caused the... Um, uh, parliament to call these companies up. <clears throat> okay. So I'm telling this story to a colleague of mine, uh, Stephen Pincus, 
who's well known here for writing um, uh, a book about uh, 1688. He spent some time looking at archival uh, resources. And he goes, you know, you should go over to the Beinecke. There's this interesting um, notebook uh, written by Charles Delaunay, who was the, uh, he was the secretary of the Earl of Stanhope. And it, I'm sure it, it goes through daily what's going on with the South Sea Company and what the parliament's doing. I said, boy, that sounds fantastic. So I dash over there. Usually, I, my office is not too far away. I run over there. I get the book. I start going through the notebook. And sure enough, there's a daily account of what Parliament is thinking about and doing with respect to these companies. You can't read this very well, so here's, here's what it says. <clears throat> uh, Delaunay is, is reporting back to the uh, Earl of Stanhope, who I guess can't be bothered to be, to, to be around and see the actual stuff for himself, but he says, um, these proceedings of the Lord Justices <clears throat> have struck a damp upon this sort of traffic, which is speculating in imaginary stocks and so forth. Um, and uh, the Syrophasis is the one of the nicest and most dilatory procedures in the law. And it'll cause them to, there to be a new act. In other words, he's, he's cheering on the fact that they're able to hammer down um, on the heads of these uh, speculators, with, or the, these companies, with the writ of Syrophasis. So that's, um, that was the 19th of August. We go to the 23rd of August. And then here he's recounting the actual pro uh, events where that York company comes up and the two insurance companies come up and they plead to be able to issue new uh, capital. They, they need to issue new shares. The insurance companies have to issue shares because they've got to get money, cash, more cash to pay off the, the bribe to the, uh, to the exchequer. And so now Parliament has really got them uh, where has really got them where it wants them, right? It's just really nailed them. These guys aren't going to be able to fund anything, and uh, so <clears throat> um, they were obliged to have recourse to that extraordinary one of prevailing with them to reassign half of their stock by the company to be sold out again. In other words, they want to they want to issue uh, water down their equity to get more cash in. <clears throat> And uh, so what basically is saying is that they've, um, that's contrary to the intention of the law, which was worked out in the last act of parliament, says you couldn't go raise any more money. So here we have this happening on, on the 23rd. <clears throat> and let's see if I can. You can't see the dates very well. And these are, this is Gregorian dates for a Julian event. But actually, that, that event happened right at the very peak. So that caused the crash in these two insurance companies. And somehow, the cr financial crisis that ensued crossed the channel, probably because investors in Holland were investing in both, both of these, you know, investing uh, overseas. We don't know exactly the mechanism for that, that, uh, that, 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 uh, that uh, chain, but it, it's funny because the the drop in the West Indies Company in Holland follows just uh, three days after it happened in London. And that's the length of time it takes for a boat to get back and forth. OK, so um, in the end, what happened? France restricted its markets. England restricted speculation. Holland, actually, the trading all stopped. Um, the stock markets took 100 years to get back to where they were. So it killed equity IPOs. It just killed them in those three countries uh, for a century. Uh, but the insurance company actually survived. And I'll show you a little bit about it. Uh, this is a share in the Rotterdam Insurance Company of 1720, share certificate that my friend Geert Roenhorst has. Um, and then <clears throat> the company still exists. Uh, Assurance Rotterdam, basically. Here's, a, here's its website. It's still selling insurance policies. Okay? And uh, so it's the oldest continuously operating corporation insurance uh, company um, in, uh, in Europe. That was the product of this period of extraordinary innovation. And you know, sometimes, you know, a lot of things didn't work. The manuring of land, that one didn't survive, but the innovation in insurance did. So anyway, I'll end with the cover of the book because I've just gotten an advanced copy. So, um, but but uh, this book uh, tells much of that story, and it's a book about the book. So um, it's uh, <clears throat> it's um, as I said, 
uh, it's work that involves um, not just uh, Gear to myself, but also Catherine Labio, who's uh, a, uh, a French literary um, scholar, and uh, Timothy Young, who's, the, um, who's a curator at the Beinecke Library. <laughs>